Amen. Amen. I have a quick question for us this morning. Okay. What is the quickest way to build friendship with someone? Some, some people said food. Okay. Again. Spend time with them. They're there for you. Food. Interesting. You know, I, I want to tell us a story this morning. Short story. There was a story of a boy who once asked his father. He asked, what is the size of God? His father looked up to the sky. He saw an aeroplane passing by, and he asked his son, what is the size of that aeroplane? His son said, it is very small. I can barely see it. So he says, okay, takes him to the airport. And then shows him an airplane, an aeroplane itself. So they ask him again, how big is an aeroplane? He says, very huge. So that says, God is like this. His size depends on the distance between you and him. The closer you are to him, the greater he will be in your life. And I believe that our closeness to God helps us understand how God works. You know, it can be very tough to understand God sometimes, but all we can do is trust him and allow him to work in our lives. You see, in order for us to experience God's, you know, God's power in our lives, we must walk with him, and we must be close to him. The title of the sermon this morning is Walking with God. Walking with God. You know, if you've ever walked with a little child before, it's hard to keep up sometimes with them because they walk very slow. And that's how we look like with God. And what must we understand if we want to walk with God? I have three points for us this morning. Let's turn our Bibles to Genesis chapter 5. Genesis chapter 5. If you're there, say amen. If you're on your way, say wait for me. Okay, Genesis 5. In verse 21, point number one. In order for us to walk with God, we must understand that God leads we follow. God leads, we follow. Genesis 5, verse 21, it says, When Enoch had lived for 65 years, he became the father of Methuselah. After he became the father of Methuselah, Enoch walked faithfully with God 300 years and had other sons and daughters. Altogether, Enoch lived for a total of 365 years. Enoch walked faithfully with God. Then he had then he was no more because God took him away. Sorry for I have a cold. <laughs> Enoch lived for 65 years, and it was, he, didn't, he didn't really have a relationship with God. Like you, you can only imagine what 65 years must have looked like. Not the best. But he says that he began to walk with God at 65 years old. Some of us were way younger than that, I hope, and I think so. And we get to walk with God at a very young age. Just imagine this guy. He started working with God at 65 years old. But in order for you to really understand, if you look at the few verses before this, you will see people who lived for 700 years, 910 years, very big numbers. But he says he began his relationship with God at 65 years old, and he would walk with God for 300 years. Straight. He walked faithfully. Sometimes walking a day with God can be very tough. But 300 years. This guy was faithful. You see, if you look at, like I said, a few verses before this, some people lived for like 700, 800 years, but there was no mention of their relationship with God. You can live for so long and not have a relationship with God. But this guy, just 300 years with God, and we get to read about him today. You see, our lives are very short. Maybe we're just like Methuselah, uh, sorry, like uh, Enoch here. Maybe we will not live as long as everybody. But the little life that we have with God, we make the most of it. We walk with God faithfully. You see, his walk with God, we can tell that there was fellowship. There was obedience to God in his walk with God. See, God led him after so many years to the point where he didn't even experience death. He just, they just didn't see him again. Imagine seeing someone and then you didn't see them again because God just took them away. This was how close he was to God. And, you know, maybe this is the only verse that you know about Enoch. Let's go to Hebrews 11. Let's read a little bit about Enoch again. 
Hebrews 11, in verse 5 to 6. It says, by faith, Enoch was taken from this life so that he did not experience death. He could not be found because God had taken him away. For before he was taken, it was commended as one who pleased God. And without faith, it's impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. The Bible says that he walked with God and he was commended as the one who pleased God. That was just a summary of his walk on earth. He just pleased God. You see, it's hard to read this scripture and look at ourselves because, you know, we've not even lived that long and it seems kind of tough. But I can relate. Does this scripture describe us today? Would we say that we're walking with God faithfully and we're pleasing God? Are we even still walking with God? I mean, maybe you're like, you know, God, let me just kind of do my thing for a while. Are we following his lead? You see, I got to be honest. In the midst of everything that's been going on, I got to a point where it was hard to follow God's leadership in my heart. Why? Because I had questions. You know, like, God, where are we really going? What direction is this going to lead to? There's a little bit of that in my heart. And I prayed. I'm like, God, help me to follow your lead. But there's a scripture that I want to share with you that would really encourage you this morning. That encouraged me too. In verse 6, if you read that scripture, it says, God rewards those who diligently seek him. But the question is, what is that reward? Is it money? Is it a career? Is it prosperity, like your life would just be good and no problems? Let's go to Genesis 15. Genesis 15. Genesis 15. If you're there, say amen. It's getting quiet a little bit. Genesis 15, in verse 1. Just give me a moment. It says, After this, the word of the Lord came to Abraham in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abraham. I am your shield, your very great reward. Go back a little bit. So God tells Abraham, I am your shield, your very great reward. That's it. That's all God had to offer him. I am your reward. So is it safe to say that the reward of seeking God is God? The reward of seeking God is God himself, that we get to be with God. We get to have a relationship with God every day. That's all God wants to give to us. He wants us to be with him. You know, I, I, I thought about it. What's the difference between heaven and hell? Anybody? Some people, somebody said fire. <laughs> Interesting. Anybody? Suffering, okay. So the difference between heaven and hell is the presence of God. God is not in hell. God is in heaven. And what is heaven at the end of the day? We get to be with God for eternity. The absence of God is hell. You don't have to go to hell to experience hell. All you need to do is not be with God. See, God is our greatest reward. As hard as that might sound, we might lose everything. But if we have God, we have everything. You know, that is why we have to cling to God. Because he's all that we have and he's all that we need. You see, sometimes it's hard to keep following if you don't know where you're going. Have you ever walked with someone that walked very fast? And he's just like, where are we going? We're almost there. Just, let's just keep going. Like, where are we going? And this goes to show us that walking with God requires trusting in God. Walking with God requires trusting in God. You know, have you ever been at a point where you feel like you trust God, and then something happens and you're like, hmm, I've not seen that before. There's this one going. You know, it's very easy to, you know, kind of think we trust God, but when God just shows that we're not there yet, it's hard to accept it. Have you lost trust in God's leadership? Do you feel like you could do a better job if you were the one leading your life? Like, God, you know, just give me, let me take the lead here. Let me just, I know if I lead it, I'll lead it the right way. Best believe, if you did, you probably won't lead it the right way. Because before we became disciples, we led our lives for a, few, for a few years, and it didn't turn out well. You know, God wants to be able to lead us and make us feel safe, that he's in control. For those of you that know, um, I had a little experience with airplanes, um, I remember my first time operating an airplane. It was very interesting and funny. You know, we got into the airplane. The captain told me all kinds of stuff, like, you know, just press this, press. I'm like, okay. I, was, I acted as if I really understood, but I did not. 
Um, but I just like listen to him. He's like, just press this, put your hand here. I'm like, okay, okay. So we began. We, we started moving. We started going. We made a turn. And as soon as, soon as we made a turn, I was confused because I saw another airplane coming. It's so like, why is another one coming? Why are we on the same? So I was confused. I, I got to be honest. I was, I, I almost panicked. I started to think, like, what if something just happens? What if I press something and then you all die? Be a thought in my head. And then he just told me, like, hey, just relax, relax. Just give me the controls. I'm like, OK. So transfer the controls to him. He moved around. And then we came back. And then he's like, you have the controls. I'm like, sorry? <laughs> in my heart, I'm like, this is enough. I think I've had enough. It was like, you'll be fine. Just you know, move all the way back the same way you came. I, I was really scared in my heart, because I'm like, what if I press something? And everything goes wrong. You see, in our relationship with God, that's what it looks like sometimes. We just need to hand over the controls to God. Because we probably don't even know what we're doing the majority of the time. We need to allow God to just lead the way. We need to allow God to pilot our lives. It might be rough, but we can trust that God is in control. You know, I look at, um, I spent a few days now with uh, Nathan and Noah and Nico. If you know Nicole, Nicole is a very awesome kid. Very awesome. Full of energy, very interesting. But one thing I've noticed with her is whenever she sees her parents, there's just this joy that she starts, she's just everywhere. There's just this feeling of safety that she has because she's around her parents. And I feel like in the same way, when we become disciples, we have that with God. Like God will take care of me. Like, hey, your parents persecute you, like, whatever. I love God. Be a disciple. But along the way, we start to lose that. We start to be like, God, do you, do you really, are you really going to take care of me? Or do I need to start thinking of something else? And I think what's missing sometimes, it's our, it's our awe of God. I don't know if you know what awe means. Awe is basically adoration. You adore God so much that when you look to God, you feel safe. You feel at peace. Why? Because you know God is in control. Maybe that's what's missing. Maybe it's reverence that's missing. Maybe you've had your quiet time so many times that you're like, I don't know what God is going to say today, but I think I'm good. You don't have awe again. You don't have the reverence again. Our quiet times, are they still filled with awe and deep love for God? And when we read the Bible, it's, in, it's encouraging. Like when you read a scripture, you're like, oh, God, God loves me this much? Wow. First time you read Jeremiah 29, that was my first time reading that scripture, my second God study, I felt encouraged. Like, God has a plan for me? Wow. But after some years, I'm like, this, this plan, this plan. The awe is beginning to fade away. And I want to encourage us. We must not lose our awe and trust in God. You know, if you feel like you've lost your awe of God, maybe it's time to go back to the beginning. It's just like a little child, just always feeling safe being around your parents, just feeling safe being with God because you know that God will take care of you. And if you're having a hard time, you know, really getting to that point, I want to encourage you, maybe you need to fast or maybe you need to take some time to really pray and beg God, God, help me to stay in awe of you. Help me not to get tainted by the word. Help me not to get overwhelmed by the challenges of my life. For our guests that are joining us this morning, who's leading your life today? Who are you following? Just so you know, we're all following someone. Either you're following yourself, you're following God, you're following the devil, you're following your friends, you're following your social media. We're all following someone. The question is, who are you following? See, it's time to surrender the leadership of our life to God. You know, whenever I invite you to come out of church today, I want you to reach out to them I really ask them, like, how can I have God lead my life the way he wants to lead it? Because there is no life without God. It will look like life until times get hard. But I want to encourage you to reach out to whoever I invited you and allow them to help you follow the lead of God. Amen? Amen. So point number one, in order for us to walk with God, we must understand that God leads and we follow. Point number two. In order to follow God, we must understand that God purifies so we can grow. God purifies so we can grow. In Luke 3, Luke 3, 
It's getting quiet. I hope it's not. Are we still here? Amen. In Luke 3, verse 20, or verse 21, Luke 3, and verse 21, we see the story of the Son of God, Jesus himself. He says in verse 21, when all people were being baptized, Jesus was baptized too. As he was praying, heaven was opened, and the Holy Spirit descended on him on bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, you are my son, whom I love, with you I am well pleased. Now Jesus himself was, was 30 years old when he began his ministry. It was a son, so it was thought of Joseph. So Jesus gets baptized. A dove comes down, you are my son, who I love, who I'm well pleased with. Okay. That's encouraging. You know, if someone told you that, if God told you that, you would be encouraged. Look for, in verse 1, Jesus, full of the Spirit, left the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, where for 40 days it was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days, and at the end of them, he was hungry. So Luke 3, at the end, God says, I love you. I'm pleased with you. Look for, God leads him to the wilderness. You would expect that, you know, after God said, I love you, just life will be good, merry, all good times. No. God leads him into the wilderness. And you, you must ask, what was really going on? Like, what was God trying to do? You see, the word tempted in this scripture, in context, means to test. It means to test. But what is the difference between a temptation and a test? Anybody? What is the difference between a temptation and a test? Okay, that's okay. A temptation, the goal of a temptation is for you to fail. Simple. It's from the devil. The devil tempts us so we can sin. The goal of a test is for us to pass and be stronger. The same way your teacher doesn't give you a test so you fail. Normal teachers. <laughs> a teacher would give you a test to test your knowledge if you were really listening. Not because genuinely they want you to fail. Some people are weird, they want you to fail, but not that one. But the goal of a test is so you can pass and come out strong. God tests us, not for us to fail, but so we can be stronger. Think about Job. You can imagine when the devil came to, 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 uh, uh, to God and says, who can I go and test? God volunteered Job. If you were Job and God mentioned your name, how would you have felt? Like, like, no. Why do you think God was so confident that he mentioned Job? Because he knew that it was going to get tested and it was going to pass. No, it was going to struggle, but it was going to pass. You see, in the same way, God allows us to go through times of testing because he's confident that we'll pass and we'll be stronger. You see, the devil's goal was for Jesus to fail. And then he tempted Jesus three times. One time was not enough. Three times. But Jesus overcame. Job overcame. You see, working with God would bring us through some really difficult times. Really difficult times. And it will be a test of our trust. But the goal of this test is always for us to grow stronger in our trust in God. You know, what test are you going through this morning? Is it test financially? The country is hard. Is it tests in relationships? Is it tests with your future? Like, what is going to happen in the future? What areas are you experiencing challenges in? Maybe there's some unrighteousness that God wants you to be able to overcome, and it's putting you through a hard time so you can overcome them, but you're not paying attention to them. You know, God wants us to grow. He wants us to grow deeply in these areas. But you need to sit back and ask yourself, what areas am I experiencing tests in? You know, the funny thing is God wants us to learn something. He might end up teaching us over and over again. Why? Because he wants us to be able to learn it. You see, I believe that Jesus overcame. Job overcame. We can overcome too. If we allow God to purify us. You see, in 1 Peter 1, 1 Peter chapter 1, 1 Peter 1, in verse 6 to 7, It says that in all these you greatly rejoice. Do not for a little while why you may have to, had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith. Just a moment here. 
Okay. Proving genuineness of your faith, of greater worth than gold, which perishes, even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, honor, when Jesus Christ is revealed. He says that we need to rejoice greatly because the goal is God wants us to be just like him. See, God's goal is for us to continue to grow. But are we resisting God as he's trying to help us grow? You know, I remember when we were young, and if your dad was trying to give you a haircut, it was the toughest time. They just put your head somewhere, and then they're just like, you're fighting, but you get a haircut regardless anyways. But sometimes you can be like that, and like, God is trying to teach you something, but we're like, no, not me. No. But God wants us to allow him to allow us grow. You see, I, I think of, you know, the scripture in James 1, 2 to 4. We all know the scripture. We don't have to go there. He says that we must go through trials. We'll go through trials of many kinds. But he says we must allow perseverance to finish its work. Why? Because he says we'll become mature and complete, not lacking anything. And we started to give up during God's test. Maybe it's just getting uncomfortable. You're like, God, this is too much for me. I don't think I can handle this. I'll just do something else. See, God is calling us to allow perseverance to finish its work. I think of an, a, 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 an illustration that really depicts this well. How many of us have silver on us right now? If you're wearing a silver, maybe a necklace. Okay, you can see some people in there. The raw form, I was supposed to show a picture, but I didn't, I didn't say it on time. But the raw form of silver, when it gets mined, doesn't look nice. It's rough. Like, it's not good. No shape, no form, it's just all over the place. So what does the blacksmith do? What does he do? Puts it in a very hot fire, melts it, and then cools it down, beats it into shape, shaves it, because there will be some impurities. If it's not shiny enough, you'll do that again until you have what you have today, clear silver. It's in the same way, God will put us through times of refinement so he can see his reflection in us. Because we want to be like God, we want to be like Jesus. But God wants to actually see himself in us. Because he knows that he's, he wants us to be like him and he wants us to be able to go through life just like him. God refines us for our own good. We must embrace we must embrace God's refinements. And so my, my, my practical for us this morning is, what area in your relationship with God is God trying to help you grow in? Is it your trust? Is it your love? Maybe they've discipled you so many times of being loving, and you're like, I'm loving. Maybe not. Hey, bro, you need to be more humble. I think I'm humble. Oof. Maybe these are the areas that God wants us to grow in. I myself... I'm trying to grow in my trust. Because I think I trust God, and then something happens, and I'm like, ha, mm -mm. I've not seen this one before. You see, God wants us to be able to trust him. He wants us to be able to be like him. So what areas of your life are you not looking like God yet? Maybe it's time to get open. Talk to your disciple and ask for help so they can help you. Maybe it's going to be praying together, going through some scriptures. Maybe it's going to be accountability so that we can all grow in these areas. And that's my practical for all of us this morning. And I, I pray that all of us can go after this. Amen? Yes. So like we said, number one, God leads. We follow. Number two, God purifies so we can grow. Our last and final point. In Psalm 126. Psalm 126. But number three, God saves, but we have to sow. God saves, but we must sow. In Psalm 126, it says, When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dreamed. Our mouths were filled with laughter, our tongues with songs of joy, and it was said among the nations, The Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us, and we are filled with joy. Restore our fortunes, Lord, like streams in the negative. Those who sow with tears will reap with songs of joy. Those who go out weeping, carrying seeds to sow, will return with songs of joy, carrying sheaves with them. If you read that 
top of that psalm, he calls that psalm the Song of Ascents, if you notice that. This was the psalms or the songs that the Israelites sang when they were going back to Jerusalem. So imagine, you had been in captivity for years, and you were on your way back home to Jerusalem. If we know from uh, uh, the Bible, Jerusalem was on a mountain. So them climbing up to the mountain and seeing where they used to worship before, where they used to worship God, they could not do this for hundreds of years. I sent him back to Jerusalem. They were filled with tears of joy. Why? They get to have to worship God in their own country again. They didn't have to be in captivity again. They didn't have to be slaves. Now they were free and back at home. You see, the closer they got to Jerusalem, the most, I, I, I assume that they were just joyful. Probably crying, but like, yes, we're almost home. Like, we're almost there. You see, on our way to heaven, there'll be a lot of tears. There'll be a lot of perseverance. But as God leads us to eternity, we must continue to bring more people with us. You see, at this time, if, if you read verse 5 to 6, it talks about sowing with tears and reaping with joy. As a farmer at this time, majority of the food they had during this time was usually grain, uh, like maize, rice, sorghum, all of those things. So the way to plant is you have to basically scatter seeds. So imagine a farmer had two options at this time. You had some grains, you could feed your family for a short period of time, but it would finish, and you guys would be hungry. The other option you had was to take half of it and go and scatter it with hopes that it will grow, multiply, and you have more for them. Maybe sell some to make more money. So think about this. The food you're supposed to eat, you're going to take half of it. You go into the desert with hopes that as you sprinkle it, you would grow and you have more. And it was believed that during this time, the farmers, they would carry the seeds crying. Why? This was all they had to live on. But they just trusted and were praying to God like, God, I hope that this brings me more. And your family has to watch them sprinkle the food they're supposed to eat. So imagine that. That was the pain of sowing. Sowing is not easy. But harvests brings so much joy with it. Why? Because you sowed when you were supposed to sow. What kind of farmers are we? Are we the ones that choose safety? You know, me, I just need to take care of myself, make sure that I'm okay. I'll take care of other people later. Well, we're the types that are willing to go out and continue to spread what we have been given by God. You see, this country is hard. I gotta be honest. Every day you wake up, it's like something went wrong overnight. This country is hard. And just imagine how hard it is for people that don't have God. We get to be disciples and we get to go through this with God, with hope. Some people don't have God. And they're going through a hard time. But we get to share with them what God has given to us. But it will take tears. It will take discouragement. It will take rejections, hardships, sacrifices, until we see people come to God. You see, if we want to get to 500 disciples, if we want God's truth to spread throughout Lagos, we must be willing to sow. And to sow... It will come with some tears. It will come with some pain. You know, I can imagine we'll get to heaven someday and look back at all the challenges, the time that you did not have dinner at night, where you did not eat, times where you had 001, 1000, sometimes 0000. And I, 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 I doubt that any one of us would look back and cry. I mean, oh, oh no. Why? Because you're with God. All of that is gone. You're happy because you persevered. But not just so you persevered, because you brought so many people with you. You know, the scriptures that is very hard for me to wrap my mind around, Ecclesiastes 11. This scripture is very hard for me. Why? Because it just calls you to surrender. Ecclesiastes chapter 11. Sometimes, you know, when my relationship with God, I can get very, you know, I can become an investor. God, if I invest this, I expect this. 
Sometimes I'm like that. But that's not the way God works. In Ecclesiastes chapter 11, verse 5 to 6, it says, As you do not know the path of the wind and how the body is formed in a mother's womb, so you cannot understand the work of God, the maker of all things. So you sit in the morning, and at evening, let your hands not be idle. For you do not know which will succeed, whether this or that, or whether both will do equally well. The Bible says we just have to sow at all times. You know, I would love to share my faith with someone, and they would just become a disciple. How many of you want that? I remember when I was in Manila, there was a time that we were sharing our faith. I remember one day I shared my faith. 20 people straight. They all said no. And I got to be honest, I felt like going home that day. Not like going home like I was sad, like angry, like, oh, okay. Deep in my heart, I was like, ah, shh. It was, it was really funny. But, you know, the reality is we need a soul. And it's going to be hard. We're going to feel a lot of things as we sow. But this is the same thing that someone did for us to be here. Someone sold, 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 sold. Nobody responded until you got to you, and then you did. In the same way, we have to keep sowing because we can be, we can be assured that God will make it grow. The when, we don't know. But what can we do? We can sow and just trust God. You see, practical diet for us today is when it feels hardest to share your faith, that's when you need to share your faith. Why? Because you give all of your hearts to that one person. Like, have you ever done that before? Like, you're not in the mood to share, but you share with that one person, and you're like, ah, you know, I just kind of feel like, you should really try. You're like, you really put your heart to it, to help them come to God. When it feels hardest to share, that's when you should share your faith. When it feels hardest to join a Bible study, that's when you should join. Why? Because you're now in a more vulnerable state to kind of help the person. It's not just speed mode, speed mode. That's very important, that when it's the hardest, that's when we need to obey God. And it feels hardest to go after getting visitors to church. And I got to be honest, that's challenging. But we need to keep going after it so we can bring more people to God. And I believe that if we do this, we continue to sow with faith, sow with tears. I believe that all of us will be fruitful in the coming weeks. But it's going to take a lot of perseverance. You see, in closing, one of my favorite songs in the kingdom is Anchor for the Soul. And it's a very interesting song because when you go through the lyrics of that song, it encourages your heart. I love the second stanza. I'll read it to you. It says, this world's not my home, just a passing through. Through this life, I wonder, treasure stood up yonder, somewhere beyond the blue. On my way, I learn through each path, through each path I take. Every day I'm growing, on my way I'm knowing heaven's worth the wait. You see, at the end of our lives, the biggest compliments that we can ever get is Sammy walked with God to the very end. Yosola, as awesome as she is, walked with God to the end of our life. That's the biggest compliment that we can get. Not the amount of money that we make, not the amount of houses that we have. All that will matter at the end of the day is our walk with God. You know, I look, I can imagine we get to heaven and we just look down and Jesus would ask you, was it worth it? It was. Those days where you were rejected when you shared your faith, was it worth it? It was. Those days when you didn't have anything but you kept persevering, was it worth it? Yes, it was. And I look forward to the joy that will be on our faces on that day. But in order for us to get to that point, family, we need to continue to walk with God. We need to follow God as he leads us. We need to continue to grow as God continues to purify us. We need to continue to sow as we trust that God will save more souls. I believe, my family, that this is the only way to walk with God. It's just day by day by day. And I believe that all of us will get to heaven someday and will be encouraged to see God. I love you all. To God be all the glory.